from Union Square in downtown San Francisco. It's the Cube covering Pager Duty Summit 18. Now here's Jeff Frick. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Jeff Frick here with the Cube. We're at Pager Duty Summit in the Western St. Francis Union Square, San Francisco. We're excited to have our next guest. This guy likes to get into the weeds. We'll get some into the weeds, not too far in the weeds. Uh, Armand. Dagar, he's the co-founder and CTO of HashiCorp. Armand, great to see you. Thanks so much for having me, Jeff. Absolutely, so you're just coming off your session, so how did the session go? What did you guys cover? It's super good. I mean, I think what we wanted to do was sort of take a broader look and not just talk too much just about monitoring. And so the talk was really about zero trust networking, the sort of the what, the how, the why. Right, right. So that's a very important topic. Uh, did Bitcoin come up or uh, blockchain? <laughs> or were you able to do zero trust with no blockchain? We were able to get through it with no blockchain, okay. uh, you know, <laughs> thankfully, I suppose. Uh, right. But uh, you know, I think the, the kind of the gist of it when we talk about, you know, I think that the challenge is it's still sort of at that nascent point where people are like, okay, zero trust networking, I've heard of it, I don't really know what it is or like what mental category to put it in. So I think what we try to do was sort of not get too far in the weeds, as, as you know I, I tend to do, but sort of start high level and say, right, right. what's the problem, right? And I think the problem is we live in this world today of traditional flat networks where I have a castle and moat, right? I wrap my data center in four walls, all my traffic comes over a drawbridge, and you're either on the outside and you're bad and untrusted, or you're on the inside and you're good and you're trusted. And so what happens when a bad guy gets in, right. right? It's sort of this all or nothing model, right? But now we know the bad guys are going to get in, right? It's only, it's only a function of time, right. right? And I think you see it with the target breach, the Neiman Marcus breach, the Google breach, right? The list sort of goes on, right? right. It's like Equifax, right? It's a bad idea to assume they never get in. <laughs> to assume they get in, so then when you, if you know their bad guys are going to get in, you got to bake that security in all different levels of your applications, your data, all over the place. Exactly. So what are some things you guys covered in the, in the session? So I think the core of it is really saying, how do we get to a point where we don't trust our network, where we assume the attacker will get on the network, and then what? How do you design around that assumption, right? And what you really have to do is, push identity everywhere, right? So every application has to say, I'm a web server and I'm connecting to a database, and is this allowed, right? Is a web server allowed to talk to the database? And that's really the crux of you know, what Google calls Beyond Corp, what other people call sort of zero trust networking is this idea of identity base, where I'm saying it's not IP1 talking to IP2, it's web server talking to database. Right, right, because then you've got all the roles and the rules and everything associated at that identity level. Bingo, exactly, yeah. exactly, and I think What's made that very hard historically is when we say, what do you have at the network? You have IPs and ports. So how do we get to a point where we know one thing is a web server and one thing is a database, right? right and I think right. the crux of the challenge there is kind of three pieces, right? You need application identity. You have to say, this is a web server, this is a database. You need to distribute certificates to them and say, you get a certificate that says you're a web server, you get a certificate that says you're a database. And you have to enforce that access, right? So everyone can't just randomly talk to each other. Right. Well, then what about context too, right? Because context is another piece that maybe somebody takes advantage of the of, and has access to the identity, but is, is using it in a way or there's an there's interaction that's you know kind of atypical to what's expected behavior. It just totally. doesn't make sense. So context really matters quite a bit yeah, as well. Yeah, you're super, super right. And I think this is where it gets into not only are we, do we need to assign identity to the applications, but how do we tie that back into sort of rich access controls of who's allowed to do what, audit trails of, okay, it seems odd, this web server that never connects to this database is suddenly out of the blue doing so, why? Right, right. right. And do we need to react to it? Do we need to change the rule? Do we need to investigate what's going right. on? But you're right, it's like that context is important of what's expected versus what's unexpected. Right. Then you have this other X factor called you know, shared infrastructure and, and hybrid cloud. And you know, I've got apps running on AWS. I've got apps running at, at Google. I've got apps running uh, at Microsoft. I've got apps running in the database. I've got some, some dev here. I've got some prod here. You know, that adds another little X factor to, uh, to the zero trust. Yeah, I think uh, I, I aptly heard it called once, uh, we have a service mess on our hands, right? Right, right. <laughs> we have this stuff that's sort of sprawled everywhere now. Uh, how do we wrangle it? How do we get our hands around it? Uh, and so, you know, as much as I think service mess is, you know, a play, uh, play on sort of the language, I think this is where that emerging category of service mesh uh, does make sense. It's right. really looking at that and saying, okay, I'm going to have stuff in private cloud, public cloud, right? Maybe multiple public cloud providers. How do I treat all of that in a uniform way? I want to know what's running where. I want to have rules around who can talk to who. Right, right. And that's a big focus for us with console in terms of 
how do we have a consistent way of knowing what's running where, a consistent set of rules around who can talk to who, right. and do it across all these hybrid environments, right? right? But wait, don't buy it yet, there's more. Because <laughs> now you've got all the APIs, right? So now you've got all this application integration, many of which are with you know, cloud-based applications. Um, so now you've got that complexity and you're pulling all these bits and, and, and connections from different infrastructures, different applications, some in-house, some outside. So you know, how, do, how do you bring bring some uh, organization to that. Madness. No, that's a super good question. And you know, if you're, you know, if you ever want a role change, I, I, you know, take a look at our marketing department. <laughs> You've got this down. Uh, <laughs> you know, I would say what it comes down to is heterogeneity is going to be fundamental, right? You're going to have folks that are going to operate different tools, different technologies for whatever reasons, right? Might it be a historical choice, might be just they have better relations with a particular vendor. So our view has been, how do you interop with all these things? Part of it is focus on open source, part of it is focus on API driven, part of it is focused on sort of you have to do API integrations with all these systems because you're never going to get sort of the end user to standardize everything on a single platform. Right, right. It's funny, we were at a show talking about RPA, uh, Robotic Process Automation, and they, uh, they treat those processes as employees in, in the fact that they give them identities. Right. So they can manage them, you hire them, you turn them on, they work for you for a while, and then you might want to turn them off after they're done or whatever doing them uh, that you put them in place for, but literally they were using, you know, the you know, treating them as an employee, treating them as right. with like an employee-led identity that they could have all the assigned rules and, and mm. restrictions to, to then let the uh, the RPA do what it was supposed to do. <laughs> it's interesting. Like, interesting concept. Yeah, and I think it, it mirrors, I think, what we see in a lot of different spaces, which is what we were maybe managing before was the sort of very physical thing. Maybe it was like we called it robot one, two, three, four, right? Or in the same way we might say, this is server at IP one, two, three, four right. on our network. And so we're managing this really physical unit, whether it's an IP, a machine, a serial number, how do we tick up the level of abstraction and instead say, you know, actually all of these machines, whether IP1, IP2, IP3, they're a web server. And whether it's robot one, two, or three, you know, they're a door attached. Right, right, right. And so now we start talking about identity and it gives us this more powerful abstraction to sort of talk about these underlying bits. Right. And I think it sort of follows the, the history of, of everything, right? Which is like, how do we add new layers of abstraction that let us manage the complexity that we right, have? Right, right. So it's, it's interesting, right? And Ray Kurzweiler's keynote earlier today, hopefully you saw that, you know, he talked about, you know, basically exponential curves and that's really what we're facing. So, you know, the amount of data, the amount of complexity is only going to increase dramatically. We're trying to, virtualize so much of this and abstract it away, but then that adds a different layer of management. At the same time, you're going to have a lot more horsepower to work with on the compute side, so is it is it kind of like the old uh, the old Wintel, I got a faster PC, it's getting eaten up by more uh, more windows? I mean, do you, do you see the automation being able to keep up with, you know, kind of the increasing layers of abstraction? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I think there's a, there's a grain of that, you know, are we, are we losing, uh, you know, just because we're getting access to more resources, are we using it more efficiently? And I think there's some fairness in at, with each layer of abstraction, we're sort of introducing additional performance costs, sort of reduces it, but I think overall, what we might be doing is increasing the amount of compute tenfold, but adding a 5% additional management fee. So it's still, I think it's still net net, we're able to do much more productive work, go to much bigger scale, but only if you have the right abstractions, right? And I think that's where this kind of stuff comes in is, okay, great, I'm going to have 10 times as many machines. How do I deal with the fact that my current security model barely works at my current scale? How do I go to 10x the scale? Or if I'm pointing and clicking to provision a machine, how does that work when I'm going to manage 1,000 machines? Yeah. Right? You have to bring in additional tooling and automation and sort of think about it at the next higher level. And, yeah. and I think that's all, all part of this uh, process of adopting cloud and right. sort of getting that leverage. It's so interesting, just the, the whole scale discussions at the end of the day, right? Scale wins, and there, there's a great... Uh, interview with, with James Hamilton from AWS talk, and it's old, but you know, he's talking about you know, kind of scale, and he talks about you know, how many servers that were sold in this whatever calendar year it was, versus how many mobile phones were sold. You know, and it's, it's many orders of magnitude different, and, and the fact that he's thinking in terms of you know, these types of scale, as opposed to, you know, which was a big number in the server sales side, but really the scale uh, challenge introduced by these giant clouds and, and, and Facebook and the like really change the game fundamentally in how do you manage these things. Totally, totally. And I think that's, that's been our view at HashiCorp is that when you talk about kind of the tidal shift of infrastructure from on-premise, relatively static, VMware-centric to AWS plus Azure plus Google plus VMware, it's not just a change of, okay, it's one server here to one server there. It's I'm going from one server here to 50 servers that I'm changing at 
every other day rather than every other year, right? right? And right. so it's this sort of order of magnitude of scale, but also an order of magnitude in terms of sort of the rate of change as right, well. Right, right. And I think that puts downward pressure on how do I provision? How do I secure? How do I deploy applications? How do I secure all of this stuff, right? right. I think every layer of the infrastructure gets hit by this change. Right, right. All right, so you're a smart guy. You're always looking forward. What, what are some of the things you're working on down the road that, that you know, big challenges that you're looking forward to tackling? Ooh, okay, that's fun. I mean, I think the biggest challenge is how do we get this stuff to be simpler for people to use? Because I think what we're going through is this, you get this sort of seesaw effect, right? Which is, okay, we're getting access to all this new hardware, all this new compute, all these new APIs, but it's not getting simpler, right? It's right, getting exponentially right. more complicated. Right, right. And so I think part of it is, how do we go back to sort of looking at what's the core drivers here? It's like, okay, well, we want to make it easier for people to deliver and deploy their applications. Let's go back to sort of, in some sense, the drawing board said, how do we abstract all of these new goodies that we've been given, but make it consumable and easy to learn? Because otherwise, you know, what's the point? It's like, you know, here's a catalog of 50,000 things and no one knows how to use it. Right, right, right. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny, I'm, I'm waiting for that next abstraction for AWS instead of the big giant uh, slide that, that Andy shows every <laughs> year. It's just, uh, I just want to plug in and you figure out right. what connects on the back end. I, don't, I, can't, I can't even hardly read that stuff. The Maybe AI small. will save us. <laughs> Let's hope so. All right, Armand, well thanks for, uh, for taking a few minutes out of your day and, uh, and sitting down with us. My pleasure, thanks so much, Jeff. All right, he's Armand, I'm Jeff. You're watching theCUBE, we're at PagerDuty Summit in downtown San Francisco. Thanks for watching.